After a half century of not leaving low Earth orbit, humanity is once again looking to the stars. The first era of space exploration was fueled by the rivalry between two competing superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. But the world is a very different place now. As private companies cut through bureaucratic inertia and do great things, old enmities rise again. After almost three decades, Russia has decided to back away from cooperating with the United States in space and is looking to join with the economic superpower that is modern China to start building a colony on the moon. The importance of this alliance cannot be overstated. What could Russia offer China in this partnership? And what is the future of Russia in space? Hello and thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and help support us on Patreon if you can. Russia has chosen to partner with China and build a base on the moon. Let's look at why they may have made this decision and what it could mean for all of us. China is rising to make a place for itself in the world proportional to its potential. Throughout history, China has always been known for their technological brilliance. They lost a lot of scientific expertise during the Cultural Revolution, but are making rapid progress now and having repurposed older Soviet technology for their space program, are advancing there also. Now before my fellow Americans smirk at benefiting from another nation's technology, let me remind us all that America got to the moon mostly because of this man, Werner von Braun, who did not start off an American, to say the least. As World War II came to an end, and the United States and Soviet Union divided the spoils of war, the United States was able to capture lots of V-2 rockets, tons of documentation, and the engineer that designed them. The Soviets were able to secure several engineers who had worked on the V-2, but had nothing close to a von Braun. After cooperating with each other to defeat Nazi Germany, the Cold War started, and the two nations became bitter rivals. Nowhere was this competition more evident than in space exploration. The U.S. clearly had the best German technology, but despite this advantage, the history of former Soviet rocket accomplishments is astounding. Thanks mainly to this man, Korolev, one of my personal heroes. With the help of Korolev, the Soviets put the first satellite into orbit with Sputnik 1, first animal in space with Sputnik 2, first man in orbit with Vostok 1, first woman in orbit, first spacewalk, first to land a spacecraft on the moon. And then Korolev died. Using the rockets built by Korolev, the Soviets went on to have a few more firsts. Being the first nation to land a spacecraft on another planet, putting the first space station into orbit, and being the first to land a spacecraft on Mars. But their moon rocket, the N-1, never made it to orbit, and the United States jumped past to land humans on the moon. The Soviets were never able to accomplish this last goal, but in all fairness, by the 1970s, the Soviets had a lot on their minds. The Soviet Union was the largest nation on Earth. Communist policy at that time was to have near complete central control over the economy. With a nation that spanned six time zones and extended from the Arctic to Afghanistan, micromanaging the economy proved not just difficult, but impossible. Shortages of necessary goods became common. Companies were given impossible quotas and did not have the resources to adequately reward its best employees. The Soviets were also expending capital and lives in a war in Afghanistan. The Soviet economy started faltering. The Soviets went from believing they were destined to take over the world to watching the empire they had built fall apart. The expense of maintaining a massive military was exhausting the Soviet economy, while the U.S., with a much less restricted economy, was growing exponentially. The leader of Russia, Gorbachev, believed that ending the Cold War would give the Soviet Union the breathing space it needed to get back on track. But the hardcore believers in the Soviet Communist Party would not tolerate this and saw it as a surrender. The Soviet agency tasked with protecting the government, the Committee for State Security, or KGB, took Gorbachev into custody. In the Soviet Union, the KGB controlled part of the ICBM launch codes while the president, Gorbachev, had the other half. When he was seized with those codes, the KGB had everything it needed to order a preemptive strike and try to wipe out their greatest enemy. I was an ICBM commander at this time, 
and I can tell you that we were acutely aware of these developments. The world came remarkably close to ending for humanity. But this man, Boris Yeltsin, stepped forward. He had resigned from the Central Committee and called for representative democracy prior to the coup attempt, and with the help of many others was able to de-escalate the situation. War was averted, but the center could not hold, and the Soviet Union still fell apart. And with heavy drinking, so did Boris Yeltsin, handing power off to his deputy as he suddenly resigned. That deputy was a former KGB agent who had seen the United States as the enemy his entire career. In all fairness, the United States missed an opportunity to help Russia become a true democracy. Instead of having mercy on the former Soviet peoples after the collapse, the United States hired away its scientists and took advantage of its weakened state without adequately supporting democracy there, leaving chaos and a power vacuum, rapidly filled by graft and oligarchs. Soviet space progress had slowed after the moon race but it had not stopped. The Americans had abandoned Apollo technology to build a space shuttle, which could only operate in low Earth orbit, but was convenient for building a space station. I have never understood why anyone thought it was a good idea to combine heavy lift with human passengers, but we'll go into that in another lesson. The Soviets had been trying to keep up with the United States, and in doing so had been able to complete the most powerful rocket the world had seen since the Saturn V. This is the pinnacle of Soviet achievement. The energy of rocket was completed and flown twice. It was much more powerful than the N1 would have been. It could have put the Soviet Union far ahead of the United States in moon colonization. Let's take a close look at this rocket system and compare it to other super heavy lift rockets. The Saturn V was a three-stage rocket system. With the first stage burning RP-1, which remember is basically jet fuel or kerosene, and liquid oxygen. The second stage was covered in depth in this video and burned hydrogen. This added a lot of efficiency and improved the overall performance of the rocket. The third stage also burned hydrogen. A nuclear third stage was designed but never built. The Saturn V could put 118 tons into low Earth orbit or send 41 tons to the moon. The Soviet N1 never made it to orbit, but had four stages, all burning RP-1. And it worked, it was expected to get 95 tons to low Earth orbit and 23.5 tons to the moon. This was significantly weaker than the Saturn V. The Energia rocket system, however, was a massive design. It had four boosters burning RP-1, surrounding a central core burning hydrogen. It would have been able to put 100 tons into low Earth orbit and get 32 tons to the moon. The Energia was designed in the mid-70s after the cancellation of the N-1. Some of the infrastructure built for the N-1 was repurposed for the Energia. The Energia was planned to compete with the U.S. Space Shuttle. It would carry the Soviet shuttle, the Buran, to low Earth orbit. It would also serve as a super heavy cargo lifter. The boosters were each the size of many standalone rockets. They were in fact the first stage of a Zenit rocket and were almost 40 meters tall and 4 meters in diameter. Each booster had one RD-170 engine. The RD-170 is still the world's most powerful liquid-fueled rocket engine. It has a thrust of 7,250 kilonewtons at sea level and 7,900 kilonewtons in vacuum. To put this in perspective, the Apollo F-1 produced 6,770 kilonewtons at sea level and 7,770 in vacuum. The Soviets, like the Americans, had problems with combustion instability with such a large combustion chamber. The Americans had put dividers into the top of the combustion chamber to reduce this effect while the Soviets solved the same problem by having four separate combustion chambers. All the chambers were fed by one stage combustion cycle turbo pump system. Remember that the F-1 was open cycle, using a gas generator, losing some efficiency. But the exhaust from the F-1 was fed along the interior walls of the nozzle to help cool it, and can be seen here, as darker plume on the outside edge of the flame. The RD-170 can be seen here. You can see the separate thrust chambers and nozzles. The Americans have usually felt like this was four engines fed by one turbo pump, seen here. This turbo pump was a single shaft, oxygen rich stage combustion system, burning just a little fuel with a lot of oxygen for power, producing 170 megawatts. Here you can see the piping system through which the partially burned oxygen was then fed into the combustion chambers, along with the proper amount of fuel. But the Soviets considered it one engine. The thrust ring is here and distributed the force produced by the engine. 
The actuators to gimbal and vector the thrust are seen here. The RD-170 could swivel on one axis, while a variant called the RD-171 could swivel on two axes, and was used for the Zenit rocket, designed and built in Ukraine. The Zenit rockets were fired by sea launch in the Pacific Ocean where the Odyssey launch platform was used. The Zenit rockets have had 71 successful launches out of 84 total. The Energia rocket system was more advanced in many ways than the American shuttle system. Each booster on the Energia could be throttled down with better control than the Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters. The American solid rocket booster at 12,000 kilonewtons individually had more power than one Zenit booster. But the American shuttle only had two boosters, while the Soviet Energia system had four, giving the Americans 24,000 kilonewtons of thrust versus 29,000 kilonewtons for the Energia system. The boosters had parachutes like the Americans so they could be reused. By the way, if you take an RD-170 and cut it in half so you have only two combustion chambers, you have the RD-180, used on the American Atlas V and later the Antares rocket systems. Cut an RD-180 down to just one combustion chamber, and you have an RD-191. This will be used on the new Angara reusable rocket being developed by Russia. The central core of the Energia had a large hydrogen tank, like the American version. But unlike the American shuttle, the center tank had its own engines. There were four RD-0121 Hydrolox engines at the base of the core stage. This meant that the Energia rocket system could be launched without a shuttle attached giving the Soviets a heavy launch rocket system almost equal to the Saturn V. The RD-0120 were slightly more efficient than the Space Shuttle main engines, with a specific impulse of 454 seconds versus 452 seconds, and are otherwise very similar. The RD-0120 is an oxygen-rich stage combustion engine, while the RS-25 Space Shuttle main engine burns fuel rich. The RD-0120 was smaller, however, and had a thrust in vacuum of 1,961 kilonewtons, while the RS-25 produced a total thrust of 2,279 kilonewtons. But the four RD-0120 totaled 7,844 kilonewtons, while the shuttle's three engines produced only 6,837 kilonewtons. Since the retirement of the U.S. Space Shuttle, the Americans are still struggling to convert their Space Shuttle system to a heavy-lift standalone rocket, something the Soviets had designed into their system and accomplished 30 years ago. The Energia rocket launched twice, once with the Polyus system, which you see here. The Polyus was an experimental orbital weapon systems platform and does not get enough recognition. Once President Reagan announced the militarization of space with the American Star Wars program, the Soviet Union felt they had to respond. The Polyus was designed to compete with the American Star Wars program. Polyus was 37 meters long and 41 meters in diameter. Its core was a TKS propulsion and control system mated to a SCIF-D orbital weapons platform. The TKS was a manned spacecraft, larger than the Soyuz, that would be used to service the Salyut civilian and Almaz military space stations. The SCIF-D was a large orbital platform that dwarfed NASA's Skylab space station. Combining the two created a massive orbital military platform. For my American friends, it was over 120 feet long, and 13 and a half feet wide. It had a radar absorbing outer shell and there were several experimental weapon systems on board. It had a megawatt power carbon dioxide laser to destroy satellites in orbit and it had a cannon to defend itself from kinetic kill vehicles. It had a deployment system for nuclear warheads that would be positioned as orbital mines near the space assets of its enemies. Reagan's Star Wars threats were probably a bluff. The Soviets response was decidedly not. They had also planned to use the engines with krypton and xenon gas to create artificial waves in the ionosphere, and had barium chaff to deploy in clouds to block incoming laser fire. This remarkable system was launched on 15 May 1987 from Baikonur. The system, for technical reasons, had to be mounted upside down, and was supposed to release, rotate 180 degrees, and fire its engines into orbit. Upon release, however, it had a malfunctioning inertial guidance sensor and rotated a full 360 degrees. When the engines fired in the wrong direction, the Polyus dropped out of orbit and burned up over the Pacific. Despite the destruction of the Polyus, the Energia rocket system had worked perfectly. The Soviets now had a super heavy launch system that could put 100 tons into orbit. No other nation on Earth had this capability at this time. The second launch of the Energia was on 15 November 1988, when it launched this. This is the Buran. 
The Buran had been designed by the Soviets to compete with the American shuttle system. This is an example of bureaucratic short-sightedness. The Americans had scrapped the Apollo and Saturn V systems and had invested billions of dollars into a combined crew and cargo system that could only get 27,800 kilograms of payload to low Earth orbit and nothing to the moon. It could return 14,400 kilograms from orbit, but this capability was rarely needed. The Soviet shuttle Buran flew perfectly once, returning from orbit and landing autonomously. A total of three were built but the dissolving Soviet economy was unable to support continued space exploration. The shuttles were put into storage, and no more energy or rocket systems were built. A collapsing hangar destroyed one Buran shuttle, while two more shuttles and an energy or booster system are said to still be in storage. Since the fall of the Soviet Union and with the struggling Russian economy, Moscow cannot afford to capitalize on the genius of the energy or system. By joining with China, however, the Russians can offer their technical brilliance to China's economic power. And perhaps one day, fly this. This is the Energia 2. The system was designed in the 1990s. Here you see it on the launch pad. This was called the Urigan or Hurricane and was planned to be fully reusable. The boosters from this rocket system would help lift the core into space, burning their RP-1 through the RD-170 engines, and then drop away. The core would go on into space, burning its hydrogen fuel through the RD-0120 engines, while the boosters would fly back into the atmosphere and deploy folded wings that would snap out. The boosters would all fly back for an autonomous landing at a designated airport, while the core stage would fly on into orbit. It would open much like a starship and release cargo. Then the central core would deorbit and come back to land also providing a fully reusable rocket system. And then there is this, the Vulcan variant. This rocket system would have been even larger, with eight boosters instead of four. The Vulcan was designed to get 200 tons to low Earth orbit. This is what the Russians have to offer the Chinese space program. One of the most powerful rocket systems ever flown, combined with a potentially reusable super heavy lift launch system, twice as powerful as its current competitor. The United States will have stiff competition in the new space race, and victory is assured to no one. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Support us on Patreon if you can. Everything helps, and we appreciate you. At Astro Proterra.